where a lot of the oil from like Iraq and the Gulf Coast uh, countries come out of. Look at a, uh, as an example, look at a, uh, a significant terrorist event in the Mideast that might disrupt pipelines. So you would look at those. You could look at a series of droughts in, uh, in bread baskets, let's say simultaneously in Ukraine and uh, in Australia. And how does that then really impact, uh, let's say, grain and wheat production, and, and where does that go? Uh, so those are the those are the kinds of, of things you can look at. I, I find it interesting, you know, you, you think about energy. I mean, when I worked in one of my jobs in the Department of Defense ten years ago, we were with sort of the internal Pentagon think tank, and we would get the smartest guys in the oil industry to come in and other really smart government people to come in, and they would say, okay, energy, you know, I don't care what you do, it's all about the Middle East. Fast forward, and now it's all about fracking. And it's all about, you know, we move from this east-west distribution of energy to, frankly, a north-south distribution between Alberta, what potentially goes on in the Arctic, the, just the oil and gas that we're now extracting for or for worse, uh, inside the continent of the United States, Gulf of Mexico, down to Brazil, Venezuela. So, and nobody talked about that. Even 10 years ago, it was certainly not 10 years ago, even five, it wasn't that great. But 10 years ago, they didn't. So, it, it gets into more of a, I, don't know, I guess I would call it an alternate scenario, alternate scenarios where you, you're not necessarily putting all your eggs in any of these baskets, but you start seeing what are the common capabilities that are useful in just these hypothesized scenarios, because uh, figuring out the future is pretty tough. <laughs> Ma'am. I uh, wonder if you could speak a bit about um, the kinds of research and development that has been going on in renewable energy and the development of low carbon technologies for various armed forces and um, what kinds of arrangements are in place for possibly commercializing that. Okay, I am probably not the right person to talk about that. In, in the sense that, I mean, I would, I would tell you what, what I do. We had a sister task force called Task Force Energy. Really, I'm happy to do names I don't use. Uh, and, and Phil Cullum, he ran, he ran that. So he kind of did energy, and I did climate change. And we actually kept them separate, especially in the politics of 2009, 2010, 2011. We talk about energy as a security issue, not as a climate mitigation issue. Even though we all knew, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, that it was a <laughs> climate mitigation issue. Uh, you know, at the, I mean, you, you can find, you know, my guess is if you got an iPad there, you can find out more than I can tell you right here with about three clicks. But the Navy has been working hard on uh, biofuels, uh, both sort of the traditional kind of stuff like, you know, the McDonald's fryers or whatever it is, uh, but also really looking hard at the algae. Uh, they're smart enough to know that competing with food stocks is probably not a really good thing to do, so they're not doing that. Sawgrass, I know, is, uh, is one of the things that they're looking at as, uh, as well. Uh, what the Navy absolutely requires is that if you do like a 50-50 blend of renewable or non-traditional and conventional, it has to work in the engines as are. We cannot afford to go retool all of our engines. So, and that's been proven. We've, we've actually proven that. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy has an initiative he calls the Great Green Fleet, so it will play on the Great White Fleet from early in the 20th century. Uh, and they did a demonstration, actually, it was this summer in, off, uh, off Hawaii in a, in a major exercise. And they were able to, uh, to basically use about half the fuel that, that was required of conventional fuel. Now, the other part of that is buying small quantities of non-traditional fuel, of course, is expensive. And the way it's being talked about is, yeah, you need to go commercialize this to go drive down the costs. Uh, the story that's typically told is, is this is an opportunity for the DOD to sort of lead the way like they did with GPS, like they did with the internet, and you know, a 
few other things. Uh, that's the story. The Congress, parts of the Congress have a hard time with that uh, for ideological reasons. But by and large, long story short, the Navy's actually been able to, to do that. And, and they're on a fairly good track. So that's kind of where my knowledge is. Uh, the details, I mean, you can, you can probably find them on the web. I mean, none of this is classified. Uh, but that's, that's kind of where, where they are, big picture. So, I have a yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, I had a follow-up question, uh, at least partially, on this, this issue of justifying uh, spending. Mm -hmm.
when you when you take a look at uh, how you do this, I always think of this as a three-legged stool. Uh, there's computing power, just raw computing power is one leg. There's observations is another leg. And then there's, you know, I'll call it the smart people. Okay, you gotta have the right code, you gotta have the right science in there because otherwise you're just sort of moving noise around. So when you build this, you've gotta, you've gotta have that. Uh, I can tell you that NOAA on life cycle cost is investing over 20 to zero billion with a B dollars into the next generation satellites. Uh, it's a lot of money. And believe me, it was uh, it was 20% of their entire budget is going into two satellite systems. Uh, despite what you read in the press, those are gonna fly. They're gonna fly on time. Uh, it was a, uh, basically it, it is salvaging an idea that started with Vice President Gore of everybody play nice together what that got translated to was everybody got to try to put their sensor on a particular satellite bus. It got incredibly complex. It ran way behind, way, way over schedule. So I told them, stop building the Escalade and build a Corolla. Because I can afford a Corolla, I can sell a Corolla to the hill, and that's what we're doing. So we're gonna have weather uh, information. So this gap that you hear about is frankly sort of like Mark Twain's, it's a little bit premature. So we're putting, we the US are putting, as I said, tens of billions into observations. I worry that we only put a few tens of millions into the computing. So we got this billions, millions kind of mismatch. It's not that you know we should like stop funding the satellites, they're critical. You gotta do them but we need to somehow get the balance of that stool so it's not rocking the place there. Sir? Climate affects safety and security. What we're trying to do about it can also affect safety and security. Geoengineering, mm -hmm. nuclear power is a solution to the energy problem. Uh, many of those suggestions that are out there. In how far is that part of your thinking and decision making, or has it been? You are a perfect straight. That's part of the what's next. <laughs> okay, anything else before we leave this? This is being a good discussion. All right, let me go through the what's next. There are not that many slides left, and then we can talk about anything else that people want to. Okay, surprise is still to come. There's geoengineering on the bottom, uh, bottom left. Geoengineering scares the crap out of the Department of Defense. Uh, I can say that. So, and the reason is, is there is absolutely no governance, international governance, any kind of structure. And some of the things you do, I mean, Bill Gates himself could afford to do. Uh, it's not that much money. So if I really wanted to just go and mess with like some of the policymakers' minds in the Office of Secretary of Defense, I'd say, you know what happens if we wake up one morning and we find that China's launched 20, uh, 20 rockets up to 100,000 feet with uh, salt beads to uh, you know, spread around the stratosphere and cool the whole planet because they said, hey, nobody's doing anything, so we're gonna do something. And if you listen to a lot of pretty senior folks in China, they have an engineering mentality. They think they can control a lot of stuff. So what would we do? You know, is that, and especially then, let's say, what happens if that exacerbates a drought or if we then get two category three storms in rapid succession coming into, uh, into the coast. Did it have anything to do? Nobody knows. Uh, so if you want to get an interesting debate going, just start talking about geoengineering. Uh, the, we, we were talking about this just last week with Ralph Cicero, the president of the National Academies. He believes that uh, we need to do controlled experiments because geoengineering is one of those things nobody touches. So therefore, in the non-peer-reviewed literature, people can just write stuff and nobody knows if it's true. So Cicerone basically says, hey, subject this to science. We'll find out that 90-something percent of this stuff is no good, and we'll at least know what is left. Uh, the counter-argument is, how do you do this on a small scale, and does this genie, once it's out, does it just, is it out of the bottle? And we had very smart people arguing quite passionately back and forth on so I think more to come on that. Some of the surprises, the aerosols. Uh, I think I mentioned we really don't know very well the aerosols. 
We don't know the deep ocean anywhere near as well as, uh, as we should. And, and really through this whole thing, talking about predictions and projections, uh, I think Niels Bohr said it as well as anyone that you know, predictions are very difficult, especially when they're about the future. And you know, having understanding in this business that that you know these are not discrete. Hey, this is what's going to happen. These are probability functions. Uh, and do we even know what that shape is and how they are? Is is something we've just got to be asking ourselves so that we don't undersell what we know. But but it's very easy to get way out on a limb on specific forecasts. And if you're wrong, you can actually do a lot of damage in general to, to preparation and resilience. OK, so I talked about this. And this does, does really worry me. As we put a lot of greenhouse gases quickly into the atmosphere on the scale of centuries rather than tens of thousands of years, how does the variance, how does the stability of the climate change? And I think that's that is still a question that is uh, that is out for uh, out for grab there. And, and I might have mentioned this already, but this is a quote out of the Burroughs book, and I think it's it's true. Is you know, can you deal with one to two degrees Celsius average rise? Yeah, maybe. Is it pretty? Probably not. But it's probably a lot less bad than like four or five or six. And I'm not sure it's just a linear effect. But you start getting higher order effects, and uh, you know. So how do you how do you uh, make sure that th that we stay away from the worst? Because the the bad we can probably do, but we're going to have to. So you you take a look at at all of these, and you you know you look at either snowstorms here. You look at uh, you know how we how we've just dealt with these present present events. You know, they're very, very recent. The assessments are still going on in, in various parts of the government. I think some of it we did pretty well, like the governor calling uh, uh, calling the cars off. I think Governor Christie in New Jersey spoke very clearly and plainly to his citizens. Uh, don't be stupid, you know, in, in best New Jersey sense. Uh, but how are we dealing with some of these less dramatic but equally costly issues of drought, uh, which is, is not going away in the near future. Now, it will break. I mean, droughts always break. But how are we, are we going to deal with this systemically here? You know, and one of the things I look at on these sort of unusual events is, you know, imagine a card game. And like to get a uh, sandy-like storm or a blizzard like we had this weekend, you need three aces in your, in your hand of five cards. Well, we always think, OK, well, how many aces are there in the deck? There are four. Well, climate change is kind of like maybe it's putting another ace in the deck. So again, we're sort of changing the boundary conditions. We're changing sort of the rules of the game, if you will. So now if you got five aces in the deck, well, it's probably a little bit easier to get three. So sort of when people go down the attribution thing, I try not to spend a whole lot of time on that because I think it's more the the probabilities of the odds of getting these events rather than that was climate change and that wasn't. I think you can spend a lot of time for, you know, then what are we going to do to say, okay, so, so what? And it's really, again, it's more of this, uh, this probability. We've mentioned the signal and the noise. Uh, some people have, uh, have already read it. I think it's a pretty good book, of course, because the weather guys are the heroes and everybody else are idiots in there, so I like it. Uh, uh, yeah, I, any economists here? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so he, he doesn't like he doesn't like the, the economists very much. Another book which is fascinating, maybe not quite as many people have read, is Thinking Fast and uh, and Slow, by this guy named uh, Kahneman. He won a Nobel Prize in economics. He's a psychologist, and it's like, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? He talks he talks about a lot of things, but one of the things he talks about is, you know, when there's a gain, we people we all tend to be risk averse, like. We'll take the 80 bucks rather than gamble. Nine times out of 10, I'll give you 100. But that 10th time, psh, nothing. And it's like, just give me the 80 bucks, and we'll, and we'll call it a day. That's sort of being risk averse. But when you reverse that to, you know, hey, you're either going to pay me 
I'll guarantee you, you're going to pay me 80 bucks. Or let's have a little game here. Nine times out of 10, you're going to pay me 100. But if you roll a 10, we're even. And people will take that. Even though the smart thing for them to do over the long run is like just pay the 80 bucks and move on. It's like, hey, there's a 10% chance I don't have to pay anything. And then when I listen to either the climate stuff, you know, so a lot of times people say, well, geez, you know, the science guys say, you know, we're 90% sure, we're 80% sure that this is going to happen, it's bad, you're going to have to do something that maybe people don't want to do. What people are hearing is it's like, oh, you mean there's a 10% chance I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so it, it's a, to me, it's a fascinating one. And then another one that I find pretty interesting is not all of this is like pure science. So if, I don't know if anybody's read uh, Naomi Oreskes' uh, book, Merchants of Doubt, but you'll find that uh, a number of the people who are sort of leading the charge uh, that climate science is all hoax and all trumped up are the exact same people to the person who said that tobacco is fine for you. And so there is no such thing as ozone, and acid rain is all made up, and now climate's the latest one. And it's basically, uh, for ideological reasons, they do not want to have the policy debate. And they figured out that you know, a very successful strategy is debate the facts, or at least confuse the facts. And I sort of think of the policy as the castle. That's your center castle. Well, the ramp, the, the moat out there, that's the facts. And if you can have the debate out there, you're never going to have the policy. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the world knew, the Western world knew since the 1930s that cigarettes killed you. But how long did it take us to change that? So it's an interesting book if you're, if you're, if you're like that. Or something. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, this is one, uh, you know, we're just going to mash the gas pedal on the CO2 and see what happens, but I hope not. Uh, this gentleman here, Winston Churchill, said Americans can always be counted upon to do the right thing after exhausting all other possibilities. <laughs> so, you know, I, I would say that may be happening. This gentleman here said life is hard, but it's harder if you're stupid. So again, you know, there, there's there's glimmers of hope. And and I would I would say that ultimately we're gonna get to this. We may take it up to the very limit, you know, with and need to find the uh, find the duct tape and the cardboard to uh, to get ourselves uh, back on, on track here. But uh, America has frankly always come through. Uh, you know, is, so is hope a strategy? I'm not sure that hope is necessarily a strategy, but America has always come through. We have had some pretty grim times in our country. And while it sometimes takes us a while to figure out the right answer, we figure it out. And my guess is, is we will figure it out again. And maybe some of the events of the last few weeks, although we've been down this road before, but, uh, but there's some cause for optimism. So with that, ladies and gents, thank you so much. You've been extraordinarily grateful. This, this is the uh, USS Connecticut. We actually got to watch her come up through the ice. Uh, the, the safety briefing was kind of fun. It's like, hey, if you hear loud crackings like right under you, run. So, <laughs> so that's, nice. that, that's a good little safety tip here. And yes, it was about minus 35 and cold as all get out. All right, let's see, how are we doing? Yeah, we got a little time. So, okay, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting the five minutes till I get the hook. Sir. Um, you talked a little bit about energy as far as changing the way that they operate. Mm -hmm. um, are there any policies in place right now that are focusing on mitigation and just how the Navy, the other branches of the military um, operate in terms of resource use, consumption, Yeah, there's, there has been, for, there have been for many years uh, energy conservation programs. One of the ways that we found in the Navy that they became much more effective is if you give sort of what we call the commanding officers or the directors of those individual units some of the money back that they can, I mean, not to put in their pocket, but to spend on their base or on their ship. Uh, all of a sudden, there was a personal incentive. It's sort of the, you know, the, you read Freakonomics, you know, it's all about the incentives. Uh, all of a sudden, there was, you know, it wasn't this amorphous, you know, we're gonna save the world for 
whales and polar bears, but it's like, hey, I get more money to do the job that I need if I'm smart on how I use energy. And so we've done that. Uh, another thing the Navy has done is, you know, if just the fact of measuring how much energy you use tends to drive the use down because people say, oh my God. Uh, so we have, we, the, or the Navy has, I gotta stop this we thing. Uh, the Navy has uh, started to actually allow ships to know how much they're using. I mean, there were, there was no, when, you, when I went on my destroyer, there is no little meter that goes and spins around and around and around, said, wow, you're using a lot of energy today. Uh, now we're starting to measure that. We're measuring that in houses. Oh my God, you wanna hear the cry. Because first you measure it, and then you say, okay guys, if you're over like 115% of the average, we're gonna make you pay. And, and you thought we were shipping everybody off to North Korea. Uh, you know, there was excuses, or it's, you know, my this, my that, it's not my fault, but it's sure taken the energy use down. So uh, give people, make it an incentivize them, measure it, and then, and then you hold them accountable. Sir? Uh, you talked a little about the law of the sea, and we have treaty obligations with a number of countries around the world in terms of cooperation in many areas. Um, some countries have very large populations, even more than the United States. So can you talk a little bit about how we're collaborating with some of these large countries that have populations more than us? Because obviously, their people are going to be impacted by climate change. <coughs> yeah, the, I mean, if you're talking about in terms of what, military cooperation? Could be military, it could be uh, research, could be other uh, activities. I'll, I'll, I'll stick with what I know, which is kind of the security uh, part there. You know, so let's see, countries more than us. Well, there's a couple I can think of, like India and, uh, and China. And, you know, certainly on the research and development side, it, within the Department of Defense even, there is, uh, there is cooperation. I mean, I had like my dissertation advisor routinely going to China for, uh, for technical exchange meetings. Uh, so so there, there is that. Uh, we have found that, you know, can you find something on common interest? I think I talked somewhere back about the, the Arctic strategy. Common interests really provide a foundation for, for cooperation, but there's got to be something in it for, uh, for both. So are there technologies, something that they've developed that we would like and vice versa? Uh, are there just ways of operating? We had actually the, uh, the Chinese Navy participated in this large exercise I mentioned where we had our so-called green fleet, they actually had observers for the first time. So, so you know, it's baby steps, but it's steps there. Uh, US military has been much more engaged with India uh, in the last few years. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. But again, it's, it's, it's the way, to, uh, it's, it's a way to, to do this. So yeah, it's happening. Uh, I think, by and large, both countries are not looking for a lot of publicity on this, but it's kind of happening quietly. <coughs> Sir? Uh, this is a little off topic, but the Navy has a lot of experience with uh, nuclear power. Is there mm -hmm. doing anything interesting on that? Uh, the Navy does have great experience with nuclear power. I mean, it's being over half a century, zero accidents. They're very proud of that. Uh, if you've ever worked with the nuclear engineers, I mean, they're sort of a different breed of people. Uh, but that's okay, because the results have, uh, have, have been very, very good. And, and frankly, that, that, is, that is the acceptable minimum, is zero, uh, for, for accidents and incidents. The, the Navy, you know, can certainly provide that expertise, but I think, you know, it, it then feeds into the much bigger debate, sort of, post Fukushima of where is nuclear power going to go? You know, it had almost recovered from Three Mile Island and then, you know, when it, uh, it gets whacked by a, you know, 13 meters uh, tsunami there. So, you know, I don't know where, where that's, uh, that's going to go. Uh, some people are, you know, credible people are saying, hey, you don't really need it. You can do between wind, solar, natural gas. You can make this work. Others say if you had that 20 percent give or take of nuclear, it makes it a lot easier. We'll, we'll see where that goes. But then the Navy certainly has the expertise and, and they 
train a lot of people, and those people go out and can go out in the civilian sector and, and apply those kind of uh, standards, which I think is good for, good for the country. Okay, I'm getting the vote. Thank you very much.